Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Secretariat and Implementation Council, we welcome you to the launch of our second annual update from the Global Commission on Evidence to address societal challenges. The Global Evidence Commission, it's a grassroots effort and it's focused on using research evidence in routine times and global crises, optimizing the use of research evidence. Building momentum is the theme of Update 2024. I'm Jen thornhill I'm the Executive Lead from the Global Evidence Commission Secretariat, and I'm pleased to co-host today's webinar from Canada alongside our Secretariat's Executive Lead for the Domestic and Global Priorities, Rudolf Russell de Toy. Russ Russell, uh, Rudolf. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> it's late in the day for us. What it is late in the day, <laughs> early in the day for our uh, advanced time zones, but early, uh, late for us. No, it's uh, thank you, Jen. It's it's so nice to be here. It's so nice to have everyone joining us uh, for the launch of our update 2024. Um, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items before we jump right in. Uh, so first off, we are recording this session just so that we can share it with other people who couldn't make it. Uh, secondly, if you have any te technical difficulties throughout the session, please message Steve Lott in the chat. Uh, we We'll also be sharing links in the chat throughout the session, as you can see Steve, Steve has done already. Um, please feel free to take these, share them with your networks. Um, you can engage with us on X and LinkedIn at the handle evidence.com. Um, the, we're also glad to say the update 2024 report is live. So uh, Steve will be sharing that in the chat at some point. So please uh, share that with your networks as well. And finally, uh, throughout the session, uh, you know, please comment uh, on, on what you're hearing, ask questions, and then we will take up your questions for discussion later on in the Q&A portion of the session. If you can, please direct your question at, at a specific panelist um, that you intended for. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jen to introduce our panelists for today. Okay, maybe I'll make it through it this time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to introduce today's panelists. And uh, of course, participants, feel free to introduce yourselves at the same time. Uh, speakers, I'm going to ask you to unmute when I share your name, just so you can say hello. Uh, so starting with our Secretariat co-leads, we have Jeremy Grimshaw. Hi. And John Levis. Hi there. From Veritas Institute, the director, Laura Dos Santos Buera. Laura. Buenas noches, hello. And we also have Carrie Albright, Deputy Director and Principal Advisor with UNICEF Evaluation Office and co-lead of the SDG Synthesis Coalition. Carrie. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. And Julian Elliott, who's the Secretary and Executive Committee uh, of the Executive Committee of Alive and founder of the Future Evidence Foundation. Julian. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. And we're also going to hear from Maureen Smith. She co-leads our citizen leadership group, and we'll hear from her by video. And I'm going to pass it over to Jeremy. He's going to set us up for today's call. Jeremy. Uh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Jen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. And one of the things I'd like to recognize is over the last sort of um, over the last two years, we've been working with the Implementation Council, uh, which is, is a, a global body. John will talk more about it. We now have 60, uh, 76 organizations around the world uh, playing with us, which is absolutely great. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say, I'm, I'm one of the co-leads of, uh, of the Evans Commission, but um, uh, really I, I want to sort of uh, recognize that a lot of uh, the the, the, the hard lifting of this is being done by uh, John and colleagues at McMaster who have done a stunning job over the last uh, two years. So what's going to happen today is that John's going to launch into the highlights of the update uh, and in particular to identify ways in which we think momentum is building across our implementation priorities. And then as he introduces each priority, he'll turn to the panelists and ask them for their insights and in particular sort of uh, discuss sort of what ways do they think we're is building and um, what else can we do that would be better. Um, and then um, before we get to the question and answer, John will also present uh, uh, basically information about a number of breakthrough events taking place in 2024. These are key meetings that um, yeah, we encourage people to engage with and try and participate if they can. So now I'm delighted to hand over to John. So over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Jen. Could we jump to the next slide? Um, so our theme for uh, Update 2024 is building momentum, and it really does feel like we are finally getting there, building momentum for a step change improvement um, in each of our three implementation priorities, which you'll see on the right-hand side of this slide, but more generally in how we use evidence to address societal challenges. 
as all of you probably know, we produced our first report back in January of 2022. Uh, we produced an update one year later in January of 2023. And now here we are in, in January of 2024 with a lot of signs that things are starting to head in the right direction. But um, as our colleague Will Moy has said a few times, we feel so close, but uh, some days it still feels a bit far and we need to get a lot of these um, initiatives over the finish line in terms of being sustainably funded and really thriving. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that one of the signs of building momentum uh, is the number of organizational partners. We're currently, as Jeremy said, at 76 partners strong. Um, you'll see some exemplars of those organizations on the left. It's just a, a, a sample of the full 76. On the right, you'll see the 18 countries in every part of the world where these organizational partners are based. This doesn't count um, the organizations that um, are have a regional or global perspective. Um, in the in the lower right, um, you'll see the membership growth over the years, and then you'll see the distribution across regions. So lots of people coming to the table. Um, and if you look at the long list, you'll see it's a who's who of people from the world of decision making, uh, the world of intermediary organizations, and the world of evidence producers. If we move on to the next slide. Um, so starting with implementation priority one. When we were reflecting on what we wanted to say about this area, we felt that there were six signs of building momentum. We could have picked a number of different motivations on to build the case that the rationale for evidence support, that this is needed now more than ever, uh, we ended up focusing on two, fast moving policy crises or policy, poly crises. Um, and in some cases, people are dealing with war spillover effects, ongoing infection outbreaks, disinformation campaigns, many, many challenges. So that's one set of issues. The other rapidly developing AI, and we'll talk about artificial intelligence as being part of the solution of a more efficient evidence support mechanism um, globally, uh, but it can also be part of the challenges to which the evidence support mechanisms around the world need to respond. Second sign of things getting better, more and more pilots of ultra rapid evidence support. In the old days, people would often say evidence world moves too slowly, you come to us with single forms of evidence as if they're a panacea, but finally now we're in a position of being able to deliver ultra rapid evidence support, typically on timelines of hours and days, sometimes weeks, bringing together multiple forms of existing evidence. But we also now have a new model, a general contract or a build, builder model that says, we will listen to your question and then map that to the right trades. Uh, to try to build the evidence that you may need over, over weeks and months if it doesn't exist already. For a given question, you need, may need behavioral or implementation research and evidence synthesis, qualitative insights, data analytics, and the general contractor can bring in the right trades at the right time. Third sign of, of momentum, evidence support mechanisms increasingly aligned both up to advisory and decision-making processes and out to learning and improvement platforms. In the past, very often we worked away in our research and then crossed our fingers that we would deliver it at the right time. Now we're flipping things around and saying, tell us what your issues are. Uh, in your advisory and decision-making processes, we'll package the evidence for you very quickly, but also tell us how you're going through learning and improvement cycles and may need guidelines or other inputs and supports to those processes to drive changes on the ground. The fourth sign of building momentum more and more cross-country collaboration on evidence support. We're starting to see this emerge in education where the Ed Education Endowment Foundation is building out connections in many countries who are trying to help one another. Questions may come in from one that others have experience with and so on. We're seeing this happen in the international development space and we're seeing it happen in the health space. Many of the questions that are being asked in different countries are similar, so we can help one another out when one of us is a step ahead in answering those questions. The fifth sign of momentum, 
collaborations across forms of evidence. One of the ones that we're most excited about is the synergy between evaluation and evidence synthesis. And this is in significant part because of the leadership of people like Carrie Albright, who work in independent evaluation offices in the UN system and see the incredible value of evaluation, but also the potential to bring evidence synthesis in earlier to help with policy and program design to help with evaluations and to generally complement the insights that can come out of evaluations. Finally, we're seeing rapid evidence support system assessments in the 12 countries that are working with us to conduct them, pointing us towards fertile ground. So no matter what the country is, there are either centers of excellence or potential centers of excellence that are really where we need to be focusing our efforts in order to scale up the capacity for evidence support in a given domain. So always that fertile ground, and we need to be planting more seeds in that fertile ground. On the next slide, I won't go into it in detail. It's just an updated version of our uh, visual for the evidence support system, demand side at the top, the intermediary or interface in between, and then the timely demand-driven evidence support. Um, the, one, the, the cells that are in green are about the, the evidence support system. It may work at the level of a country or a province or state or a city. And at the very bottom, you'll see pink, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, which is the global evidence architecture, making sure that those domestic mechanisms are drawing on those global public goods in a very efficient way. The next slide is also just a slightly updated version of a visual we've been using some time at the Global Evidence Commission, the ingredients in timely demand-driven equity-sensitive evidence products. On the left, thinking about how different forms of evidence feed into different steps in a decision-making cycle. In the middle, the best evidence from around the globe, including how it varies by groups and contexts. And on the right, some of the other types of information that are often needed. Very often, policymakers want to know what are other jurisdictions like ours doing, other countries, for example. We can now pull that in as an ingredient alongside the best domestic evidence and the best global evidence to provide highly contextualized evidence support. So lots of momentum. Um, and we'll now go on to the question for our panelists, Laura. Uh, and am I turning this back to Rudolf? I believe so. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, and, and before we turn, turn it to Laura, I just wanted to check with, with Jeremy, our, our other co-lead of the Global Evidence Commission. Is there anything that stands out to you in particular when it comes to this priority? Um, no, I, th I think John's ca um, comments captured it. And, uh, um, I'd echo his comment that uh, it's, it's often sort of three steps or two steps back. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is sort of genuine progress in the last 18 months, um, which is due to a lot of work by lots of different people. So I uh, um, don't really have much to add, but uh, um, I have my fingers crossed that uh, we'll, uh, there'll be bigger announcements in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, you're teasing us. That sounds very exciting. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, Jeremy. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Laura to, to answer these two questions. So, you know, in what ways do you see momentum building in your work for this priority? And uh, where do you think we need more progress? Hi, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. The update is amazing. And we are so proud to see this moment. Um, so in terms of what do we see progress, I'm speaking uh, both on behalf of Veredas and the Brazilian Coalition for Evidence, and we've been actively engaged in the rapid evidence support system assessment. And uh, copying my colleague Lawrence from Africa that spoke today, I'll say that we have experienced through RASA the mapping of unusual suspects that are more excited than ever to be part of uh, the evidence support system systems in our country. We have government units being institutionalized on different topics outside of health. Oh, no. Sorry, I cut it, right? I'm, I'm back. Just for a few seconds. <laughs> so we yeah. have government units. 
yeah, uh, being institutionalized outside of health, which is amazing for us seeing evidence units in human rights, in education, in labor market inclusion. Uh, and also we have seen greater uh, collaboration in the regional level through the Latin America and the Caribbean Evidence Hub. But we would like to uh, see this further uh, develop during this year, priorities map together for these evidence uh, support systems at the regional level really to collaborate uh, and provide opportune evidence to our shared social problems. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And uh, yeah, that's, that's such a great point you made about the need for more collaboration and involving more groups like the unusual suspects. Um, as you mentioned, Lorenz, this morning from the an African Collective for Evidence, he, uh, he, he mentioned how they're engaging more youth and, and bringing their voices into the conversation about evidence and how refreshing that is and how it can really help us reframe it. And he, he coined it, they, they talk about, you know, using evidence as a social enterprise. So really reframing it as something uh, maybe more exciting than, than just talking about um, correlations and coefficients and whatnot. So... Uh, with that, I'll pass it back to John to talk about implementation priority two. Right, and I just want to make two other connections. One was I, I mentioned that that uh, sign of building momentum related to countries cl collaborating, and I just want to salute Laura and her colleagues with the hub um, LAC. So that's Latin American and Caribbean evidence hub that they have created. And I think it's an incredibly powerful example of a number of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean coming together to share experiences about how to up their respective games and evidence support. And something else she said this morning that really stuck with me, it's a very ambitious objective, but she noted that Brazil is hosting the G20 meeting this coming year. I know Canada is hosting, I think it's the G7 next year. Year. So uh, Laura and we um, should be thinking about, is there any way we could get a sentence or two into that communique? So that's something that we'll follow up on. So moving on to building momentum with implementation priority two. And here we're really focused on securing sustainable funding for an evolving suite of living evidence syntheses, which many of us who do more domestically focused evidence support believe will be an absolute game changer. To know that we can turn to constantly updated summaries of the best available evidence from around the globe and put it alongside the many needed forms of domestic evidence, that is a game changer. Um, and there's a couple of, of things that um, I'll just point to as signs of momentum. First, coalescing sources of cross-sectoral demand for this suite of evidence syntheses. And we're seeing it in two places. One with the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition, which Kerry co-chairs. So a group of the 45 independent evaluation offices across the UN, all committed to the achievement of the SDGs, all realizing that evaluation needs to be surfaced much more explicitly as an input to driving the achievement of those goals, but also that we need these living evidence synthesis as an incredibly powerful complement to those evaluations. The other coalescing uh, demand that we're seeing is a four country commission. The United Kingdom is in the lead preparing a blueprinting uh, exercise to articulate what this could look like. But it's four countries coming together saying we share many policy and program policy priorities. We need the same evidence in our countries. So we learn from all the evidence around the globe. Let's co-invest in a suite of these living evidence syntheses. So two incredibly powerful examples on the demand side. On the supply side, two big developments in our view. One is a new CEO at the Campbell Collaboration really committed to supporting that organization to really step into the world of AI-powered living evidence syntheses. And as you'll hear from Julian shortly, a really exciting new global collaboration called the Alliance for Living Evidence that is bringing together groups who need living evidence syntheses with the suppliers of those syntheses and pioneering new ways of getting them to work collaboratively to deliver fit for purpose living evidence products. So really a game changing model that we're all really excited to watch. Um, sign number three is 
technology and sign number four is technology, but three relates to technology that can make global evidence more compelling on the demand side. We can now imagine a world only a few years out where decision makers and domestic evidence support units like Laura's and ours um, would be able to turn to these comprehensive and up-to-date uh, databases. We could look at the content by group, like young people or elderly people or any other group by context. So marginalized inner city environments or low middle income countries. And we could look at that evidence by intervention so a stakeholder group has come in saying you should invest in this program. Well, what does the evidence tell us? Or a teacher group may say we should be putting more emphasis on peer tutoring. Or a policymaker may say, if I'm trying to move this educational metric, what are the best buys for me to invest in to really move that metric? Um, so we're getting there being able to provide that evidence in many different ways uh, so it's fit for purpose for users. On the supply side, uh, led by many people like Julian, uh, we're now seeing the potential of technology to dramatically improve the efficiency with which we produce living evidence syntheses, to have much more globally distributed production of those um, evidence syntheses, and to use them in partnership with those domestic evidence support units to drive improvements in advisory and decision-making processes and learning and improvement processes, but also to feed into cycles of research to try to reduce waste. So we focus our research investments in the areas where there really truly are gaps, rather than continuing with the types of duplicative work that we've seen so much of during COVID. The fifth sign of building momentum we're starting to see first movers, funders coming forward saying, I want to be part of the first wave of funders who start to do things better and differently. And we're also starting to see the emergence of visible champions who have credibility in the halls of power, who have credibility among a variety of different societal groups who can start to articulate the potential of all of this and why we need to have these investments from both private and public funders. And finally, we're starting to see ways into initiatives focused on other aspects of using evidence. So we're seeing the Francophone network that is part of INSA, the International Network of Government Science Advice, elevating this conversation about the systematic and transparent use of evidence in science advice and in decision-making. And I already took my hat off to the UN Independent Evaluation Offices because of the leadership of people like Carrie. They are also much more explicitly bringing the evaluation piece alongside the evidence and then feeding into member state discussions about how they do better, uh, in this case with the SDG Synthesis Coalition focused on the SDGs. So many signs of building progress. And this, it feels like we're so close. I can imagine these breakthroughs happening uh, in the coming months that we will finally get to the stage where we have a sustainable uh, funding path for an evolving suite of living evidence syntheses. In the next slide, you'll see our effort to convey this global evidence architecture. We're not sure we've got it right. It starts at the top with this highly usable set of insights. What have we learned from around the world? How does it vary by groups and contexts? This is the comprehensive up-to-date summaries. As I said before, it can be available in whatever form you need it sliced and diced in. And some evidence users will use that global evidence directly. But we'll also have these downloadable data sets that capture every study from around the world. And groups like ours and Laura can take those and the subset of them that are particularly relevant to our context and put them alongside the domestic evidence that's also needed. And all of this then sits on a set of rigorous prioritization processes, protocol registration, quality assurance, and more developmental work focused on methods and uh, equitable capacity building. All of this in turn sits on many, many people, including citizen partners, and rapidly developing technology. And we hope more and more through the leadership of people like Julian, 
the appropriate incorporation of artificial intelligence into workflows as we feel comfortable with its accuracy. So it's our take on this, the pink parts, the global evidence architecture, the green parts, those connections to domestic evidence support systems, uh, and including those learning and improvement platforms and the advisory and decision-making processes. I think that that's it for the global evidence architecture. Yes, so I'll pass it back to you, Rudolph. Thank you, John. Thanks for providing that great overview. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone, you know, please uh, send your questions in the chat and then we will come back to it later. Um, with that, I'll quickly pass it over to Jeremy. Uh, any reactions, anything to add to what John just presented? Um, yes, I mean, as someone who spent a lot of my career over the last 30 years trying to get evidence synthesis funded and particularly a lot of the global goods, uh, global public goods, uh, um, uh, 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 funded, it, it does feel like we are close. And I think there's a number of things. One is it's, I think, because as a community, the, uh, we've come together in a very generous way across sectors, um, working to increase the total pot, as opposed to fighting over, uh, you know, a smaller and, in some, and sometimes shrinking pot. And that's been quite remarkable. And I hope that spirit of collaboration, cooperation, mutual support continues because I think that if we do that, then we've got much greater chance of being um, uh, being successful. Having said that, as John said, we're very close, but paradoxically, we actually have a number of organizations that are you know, basically surviving on fumes. Um, and so there's an urgency about this. Uh, and you know, um, it, we really need to sort of try and make sure that we are advocating in whatever rooms we can, not just for us, but for some of the other uh, other groups and thinking through, you know, um, you know, frankly, at the moment, sort of, uh, you know, Prospero has been trying to find a new funding model for the last two years. And, you know, if they, if, if that doesn't evolve, then we may lose the world's major registration for evidence synthesis. So I think we have to uh, uh, continue in a spirit of generosity, continue pushing, and also trying to support the vulnerable aspects of the of the evidence architecture, um, but uh, I do think that there's a lot of really neat and exciting stuff here. So I'll finish there because I'm sure Julian's got much more interesting things to say. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so I'll pass it first over to uh, Kerry uh, to react to these questions. Um, wh where in your work do you see the momentum building? What are kind of the, those markers of the momentum and also, where do you think more progress is needed over the course of this year? Thanks, Rodolf. And again, a great, great summary. I always get so excited when I see these updates and just see how much is, is going on. Um, so, I mean, when I think back largely to the formation of the, the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition, I was excited even at that stage to get 45 UN agencies to work together is, a, is no mean feat, <laughs> let me tell you. And to also shift thinking internally from not just thinking about evaluations as something to improve internal policies and programs, which is largely the existing mandate, but also to think more about um, evaluation as a global public good um, and doing more to get evaluations out there and known and, and to sort of interact with the synthesis community. So that that was a really good first step. Um, and then we produced our, you know, our, our first synthesis and, and there were all sorts of lessons learned about you know, why, how and why we should do it differently at different levels, et cetera. But I think we had a really seminal meeting at um, the What Works Global Summit in Ottawa last year where just a lot of really like-minded people came together. I think, um, first of all, I mean, the, the value proposition of the coalition itself became a lot clearer that actually, you know, a lot of the existing synthesis work is really drawing largely upon impact evaluations, but doesn't really draw upon a lot of other forms of evaluative evidence. Um, the UN is trying to do more in impact evaluation, but what we've got bags of kind of tucked away in safes, if you like, a process and performance evaluation. So the, the how um, and the where, as opposed to the what, is, is you know, a really, as I say, a sort of potential treasure trove. And to think that we could find a way of matching these two sources of evidence alongside other evidence, such as implementation science and behavioral science, got not just the evaluators at the, at the um, the What Works Global Summit interested, and they hadn't normally attended those sorts of events or conferences, but also got the research community quite excited about um, you know, doing this together. And it's and it's not 
it's not easy. It's a lot of the evidence synthesis methodologies don't necessarily equate over to evaluation synthesis. So we're learning as we're going. Um, which kind of, as I say, this kind of aha moment um, when we did a sort of after action review for the first synthesis, we realized that that we we really needed to be much bigger than just the 45 UN agencies. Great first step, um, but um, thinking a lot more about bringing on other strategic partners who were doing similar similar things. So obviously the Global Evidence Commission, um, all the work that you were doing around systems strengthening, um, hugely relevant and valuable. Um, we brought on Campbell collaboration, Will Moy, as, as you were saying earlier, John, who um, is not only you know, a visionary, but is also thinking about reorientating Campbell towards um, um, delivering synthesis more for the SDGs. And we've had conversations with Cochrane as well, um, thinking about the same sort of thing, about the new strategic uh, scientific strategy rather for, for delivery on the SDGs. And then there's been a new role that's been created um, at the UN um, Secretary General's office, a system-wide evaluation office, which is really about trying to, again, they 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 hadn't used the word synthesis until we started talking to them about it, but it's really trying to look across the whole UN system and look at um, how you can aggregate that knowledge. And the exciting thing about that is not only that she reports to the UN Secretary General, but she also has a whole sort of suite of, of mechanisms um, to resident coordinators that can feed down to domestic level as well. So yes, it's a global coalition, but actually there's the, um, it, it was never intended just to be evidence outputs or products. It really is meant to sort of link up with the work that's happening at the domestic level. And then finally, I know I'm talking a lot, but Jeremy, I couldn't agree more. I think it's so exciting to see like-minded people coming together who want to think systemically and think bigger than their own initiatives. Um, there's a sort of self-interest aspect there. Lots of us were going around doing our pitches and there was almost like an analysis paralysis amongst people who are potentially funding saying, these all sound great. I, I don't know where to start. I don't know which one to invest in. And, and to be able to say, don't worry, you don't have to choose. We're working together. We're trying to put together this puzzle um, and you know, investing in one amplifies the work of the other, et cetera. So I, I think it's, it's really important that we think um, about what we want to achieve collectively. Um, rather than just what we want to do individually. And, and I, I taste that, I smell that. I, I really think it's happening. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you, Kerry. And I, I think we'll probably come back to that theme later on in the Q&A. You know, how can we work better together and what what might be preventing us from, from doing that? You know, so thank you for that. Um, I'll pass it over to Julian then for his insights from, from down in Australia. <laughs> Thanks, Rudolph. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Kerry. Um, I, I, I so agree with everything you're saying about the um, the momentum and the spirit. I think for me, you know, one reflection, just general reflection, is that I think when John and others first started to talk about forming the commission, there was this essentially, I think, core hypothesis, which was that coming out of the pandemic, there was this moment of time. So what we expected would be an important but time-limited opportunity to really engage a broad set of actors to try and truly shift the evidence system. And I think that was really based on a hypothesis that we could engage senior people um, in a way that we hadn't previously, but also that there was a sense of a like a burning platform within the, the evidence world, that those of us who were, have been working in evidence and evidence for a long time were... I think heartily sick of the problems that we had not solved over recent decades. And I think we're strongly motivated to use this moment of, of opportunity to try and change that. So I, I would say at this point, I would um, that the hypothesis has been tentatively proven <laughs> we, uh, that we have rejected the null hypothesis. Um, I think the the, what are we now almost three years into the um the commission's work um it's been an incredible journey and i i think it's it's just been hugely successful in in creating a new conversation and a, and a new moment um so hats off to everyone who's been leading and, and involved in this um so that i think is really the most important that 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 there is this moment and i and i feel there's an increasing number of people who understand and then can see a, a new path forward um, there are also, of course, challenges. Um, I think, Jeremy, you mentioned how, you know, a number of really significant organizations who have been very long-term champions for, for creating a better world through the use of research evidence are, are really struggling at this point. 
um, including Campbell, Cochrane and others. And so there are some very significant short-term challenges. We need to make sure those strong, independent brands and voices remain strong and become stronger, um, you know, as, as these kind of new pieces come together. Um, I think also, you know, people have mentioned a, a little bit around artificial intelligence, machine learning. I, I, it's, I think it's very clearly both a challenge and opportunity. I think the challenge is that, that um, we're, we're going to see an, an explosion. We are just at the start, but we're going to see an explosion of, of products and tools and services that are really, that are built off AI that do not incorporate the, um, the standards and principles um, that we know that that are at the core of of good evidence and good decision making, and they will be very very attractive to decision makers, to policy makers, and others. They're using them already. They will increasingly use them. I think there will be a sense of why do we need anything more than this? I can get everything I want just from entering my question. So I think for those of us in the evidence world who understand and have a real commitment to the way that we can use research evidence in much more effective ways to, to make better decisions, we need to move very, very quickly. Um, we do not have much time. And I think the core message of the commission being we need stronger systems is, is primary. We need that, but we also, of course, need to look at the ways we can very rapidly build systems that use um, AI or machine learning in, in more productive and positive ways. And, and on that note, I'm very optimistic. I think the, um, you know, the, the underlying language models that these technologies are built off are very powerful and they will enable us to build much more, much stronger systems. I, um, I never like to mention my own initiatives, but I think people are expecting me to mention Alive. So to just to mention, so Alive is um, Alliance of Partners looking to advance the living evidence model. Um, I, of course, very heartened about the way that living evidence is getting momentum. And I think people understand that now we are kind of within reach of having evidence products that are both trustworthy and up to date. But to me, for those of us who have been working really closely in living evidence in recent years, we understand that living evidence is not really about an evidence product. It's about the coalitions or the partnerships that you build around that. The key, the key opportunity is the conversations because living evidence is dynamic. It's always changing, it's always evolving. And I think what we're trying to do in Alive is really build a model in which um, evidence users are, are in the driver's seat. They are, it is truly demand driven. It's not a, it's, it's not a commissioning process in, in essence. It's really a conversation in which evidence users are, are expressing their questions, their concerns, their contexts, and we have an evidence system that can respond dynamically and efficiently to that. Um, and so in terms of what I want to see, of course, I'd love to see that model tested in many different settings and so that collectively we can better understand how best to advance that model so that we don't just have um, up-to-date evidence, but we have evidence that is really responding to the questions and concerns of decision makers. So um, kudos to the three Js for driving all of this and to everyone else who's been contributing. It's been an amazing journey. Great, thank you very much, Julian. I'll pass it back over to John. Great, if we could just pull the slides up, I'll, I'll quickly cover implementation party three, and then we'll hear a few words in video form from Maureen. Um, so signs of building momentum with implementation party three. So this is about putting evidence at the center of everyday life. One, a lot of partners coming together to learn from one another. One example of this has been our partnership with Cochrane and the World Health Organization's Evidence Informed Policy Network, a webinar series, um, creating an opportunity for citizen serving NGO leaders and citizen partners to come together to hear about what's working, what's not working, how do we think about scaling up efforts to put evidence at the center of everyday life. Um, Second, we're seeing greater acknowledgement of citizens being inundated with information, but also the very significant misinformation and disinformation challenges that are uh, taking place and more commitment to finding effective ways to counter mis and disinformation with some new living evidence syntheses about to come online that will help to inform the execution of those strategies. 
Third, more appreciation for the strong headwinds. And in the Global Evidence Commission update 2024, you'll see what we see as being some of those headwinds. A number of them were surfaced at some uh, consumer events that we participated in, one that happened at the Cochrane meeting, but also a sense of the need to lock arms to make progress against those headwinds. And then that sets up the fourth sign greater recognition that we need to use a collective impact orientation. And the Global Evidence Commission and many of us as partners in it are really trying to work behind the scenes with that evidence lens, making the call for citizen engaged evidence production and supporting those groups that are doing such exemplary work to put evidence at the center of everyday life. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a slightly updated version of the visual that we used in our last update, the major changes being the addition of that fifth column, uh, giving citizens a bigger role in system transformations, which is a, a message that we're hearing from many countries, people um, tired of their health systems, their educational systems, their social service systems not meeting their needs and wanting to make sure that people like them are at the table asking difficult questions and being supported to participate in advisory and decision-making processes. And the other changes at the bottom that focus on building or developing trust and keeping equity, diversity, and inclusion or leave no one behind approaches front and center in all of this work. We go to the next slide. I think the next slide, yes, the next slide is is the question. And I, but I think we're going to kick it off with the video. But Jen, I'll turn it over to you to um, introduce Maureen's video. Yeah. So Maureen Smith, who I uh, introduced at the top of the call, co-chairs our citizen leadership group. She couldn't be here, but she really wanted to share that. You know, given those headwinds, she thinks the biggest step forward is taken when organizations have been coming together to put evidence at the center of everyday life. So Steve, thank you so much, our producer. Here we go, this is Maureen. Putting evidence at the center of everyday life has never been more important. And update 2024 reconfirms our commitment to this priority. We're not doing it alone. Cochrane, the world's largest producer of evidence synthesis and home to the Cochrane Consumer Network, and the World Health Organization's Evidence Informed Policy Network, EVIPNET, are key partners, each of which has also confirmed that citizens need support. We know the headwinds are strong. There's more information, including growing misinformation and disinformation than ever before. And that makes the need to help citizens find reliable evidence more important than ever before too. One of the ways we are committed to helping is creating the space for discussing what works. Specifically, what are citizen leaders and citizens serving non-governmental organizations doing to liberate the best evidence so everyday people can find it and use it when they need it? What are evidence producers doing to engage citizen in the evidence that's produced? And what are decision makers doing to free up space for citizens to have a seat at the table? The organizations we've already engaged through our global webinar series and in-person events tell us that we need more spaces like this to talk to one another, learn from one another and collaborate. No one organization can do this alone. And if you're keen to work with us, then we're keen to. Thank you. So thanks to Maureen for being here, even when she can't be here, but I'll just pick up, she mentioned the webinar series that we're doing in partnership with Cochrane and, and the World Health Organization. We have two more webinars coming this year uh, that follows the series that started last year. So the first we've, or the first this year is, is pushing past platitudes as we've called it, because you know, there's a lot of rhetoric around system uh, transformation and engaging citizens, but this is about real engagement, creating real change by engaging everyday citizens uh, in changes that affect the lives of everyday people. That's coming up February, um, beginning of February. And then we're working on a fifth webinar that it, it's going to see a return to a key section of the report, uh, the, our foundational report, the section on Indigenous rights and ways of knowing. Uh, so I think in countries that, you know, share a similar colonial context, it's crucial. And I think it also hits our cross-cutting themes that you referenced, John, in the figure 
on building trust and considerations around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I'll just mention, Will Moy was on our call this morning, and he, of course, had great insights. Um, of course, the former CEO of Full Fact uh, UK, which is part of an international fact-checking network, now the CEO of Campbell Collaboration. And he said, well, of course the headwinds are strong. It's because this is the area where the most people are affected. And I think in effect, he also said, it's also where the most is at stake because, you know, do you consider political parties trying to get the vote or companies trying to get the product purchased? Uh, there is a lot at stake there. And ultimately this is the area that matters most because it's citizens making decisions about their own lives, but it's also the degree to which they're able to hold their leaders to account. Um, he applauded the focus on this area because otherwise, you know, he said the evidence demand uh, folks talk to themselves and the evidence producers can sometimes talk to themselves. But, you know, citizens are kind of that uh, marker that brings everyone to get together. Um, he also said that um, just from a fact checking standpoint, organizations that are helping citizens confront and make sense of this deluge of information, misinformation, disinformation, um, we need that now more than ever. Um, because there's just so much more information. We need trusted sources. So uh, I would encourage people to go back and hear what Will had to say, because it was just, it really, it got us riled up. We need to move from the talking to more doing. Yeah. So John, I'll pull up your slides for the last section on right. breakthrough events. And I'm so glad that you brought in Will's comments from this morning. I think you captured them um, really well. So our sense is that um, this is a year where we have the potential for breakthroughs and we've singled out five events that we think are absolutely critical. And we'll start with two on the demand side, one that brings together leaders from around the globe, the summit of the future, um, Carrie and her colleagues will have an opportunity to begin to showcase what the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition is capable of, but also to paint a picture of what the future could look like with sustained investment. Um, we also have government science advisors from around the world um, who are one step away from those heads of government, but play absolutely critical intermediary roles. They're coming together in Kigali, Rwanda in early May. The Global Evidence Commission um, will, will thankfully have an opportunity to share its messages um, at that meeting. Really great opportunity to talk to science advisors about how they can more systematically and transparently use evidence in their science advice. When we turn to the evidence supply side, a really exciting opportunity in the climate solution space to broaden the conversation from modeling where the climate world has really been at the vanguard of uh, bringing that form of evidence into decision-making processes and say, we also need uh, evidence synthesis and other forms of evidence if we're going to have the adaptations, the climate mitigations, the other approaches actually make a difference on the ground. So a great opportunity to bring together different evidence communities with the decision makers who will be acting on that evidence. The Global Evidence Summit is an opportunity to bring together evidence synthesis world and guideline world, but we also hope that will be an opportunity to talk about how do bridges get built to the communities that produce other forms of evidence, and how do the connections get made to the evidence intermediaries and the evidence users, uh, where uh, at the end of the day, the rubber needs to hit the road in order to see the impacts achieved. And then Carrie's world, the evaluation world coming together near the end of 2024 with a really great opportunity to advance that conversation about how do we put evaluation, evidence synthesis, and other forms of evidence to drive a future of uh, attainment of our global goals and our domestic priorities. So you'll see those uh, events arrayed by date at the bottom. We know there's a lot of other conversations happening. Uh, not the idea of a living evidence meeting, uh, perhaps in Q3 of the coming year, uh, a funders forum that is likely to be convened. Neither were quite ready to be talked about publicly, but we know that they are likely to come and other events coming. But Go to these events, contribute to the breakthroughs. 2024 has to be the year where we land a lot of these uh, sustained investments and commitments to action. If we go to the next slide, um, conclusion, I won't read uh, this in any detail. I'll just say we're keen to work with any group that's out there. 
there are ways that you can contribute to one or more of these implementation parties. If you think there are ways that you can complement what the Secretariat and, and our key partners are doing, please let us know. Um, so please email us, uh, book a call. Very happy to talk about where the opportunities are for you to make a difference going forward with this collective impact uh, orientation that we're also committed to. Jen, I think that is it for the slides. Yep. And we're on to questions. Well, I'm going to pose the first question because we, we get it a lot. And actually, during this call, you announced we had 76 members of the Implementation Council on the land shared that we're really close to 77. So we expect that number is going to, going to continue to uh, increase. So can you share with us, John? I mean, how can, you know, what ways can we build out the Implementation Council? Uh, you know, where or what kind of support might be needed? Um, like what would be some of your aspirations on, and Jeremy, I'll ask you the same, what would be your aspirations for that group? It is a growing group. Clearly there's lots of interest, um, but where could we continue to grow? Well, I think that we need, you know, as many members as possible, the more folks that are aware of the messages and able to communicate them in their own context, the better. I mean, this will happen because many, 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 many people um, ask difficult questions of people in power and push for changes in an array of different meetings and other uh, environments. So that's the most important thing, that we have a very large and growing community of people pushing for some of these breakthroughs that we think are so essential. Um, second thing is, I think we need to further enrich the diversity of folks who are members of that implementation council. I think we've got a lot of the absolutely key players on the evidence producer side, synthesis world, guideline world, evaluation world. There's some of the forms of evidence that aren't as well represented around that table, the data ana uh, analytics people, the modeling people, the qualitative insights people. So we need to get more of them at the table. There's a fair number of the evidence intermediaries groups represented, Laura and many other colleagues, but there are so many of them out there and we need to figure out how to connect to them and including the government science advisors who are the ones whispering in the ear of senior decision makers. Um, and then there's those actual groups, the parliamentary uh, representatives and others, there are subgroups of those that have a personal passion for evidence, and we need to better connect to those. So uh, those would be two answers on my side. Jeremy, what would you add about Implementation Council? Well, uh, one thing is that it, it, it really focuses on organizational partners, but in the earlier call today, someone said, is there a fee? And no, it's actually free. You know, what we're looking for is like-minded organizations who can both use the work of the Evans Commission um, for that, you know, to benefit them, but also to make this wider case we were talking about earlier. Uh, the, the other thing is that if we are going to, I mean, where we have made progress is not because it's been the Evans Commission Secretariat that is necessarily doing all of the pushing. And if we're going to continue to make progress, we need diverse uh, coalitions of stakeholders around the world arguing for a better evidence system. Uh, and so whilst the, I think the Evans Commission has been a great catalyst of this, we really are looking for more and more, it should be other people who are taking the arguments out to their decision makers in their jurisdictions and their sectors, so that um, we're actually getting the impact we can. Uh, what you've got is a very, very small team of the Evans Commission, and it feels like we've been running something like an ultra marathon for the last three years. And if you know my body shape, you know that's not comfortable. Um, so we do need other partners to help us take this on. Um, because you know, we also always said the Evans Commission was time limited. We're not quite sure when we're going to call time, but um, at some point in time, we're going to run out of juice uh, and, and sort of the ability to do this. So you know, join us, participate, um, you know, uh, 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 make a difference. I think there's a real opportunity to make a difference at this point in time in our, our collective history. So those would be my comments. Fantastic. Rudolph, I think you might have a question queued up. Yeah, and, and actually just to expand on that a little bit, I, yeah. I'd be curious to hear from the other panelists if you have thoughts on, uh, are there particular um, groups, networks, organizations that you feel are underrepresented that we need to engage more 
it, within the Global Evidence Commission's work. Um, and, and, and then what does that look like as well, you know, in, in practice? I, I think we, we've heard loud and clear from all of you, we need to engage more folks, um, you know, broaden the tents, involve more people, um, but but who who are some of those groups and organizations and, and how do we do that? I don't know if um, maybe Carrie, I don't know if you want to take this one, um, speak from your perspective, your your world. So, I mean, a few, I mean, I, I sort of echo what I think what John and, and Jeremy said. I think there's a real potential for, for parliamentarians to get more involved. Um, I think also potentially, I don't know, so much about the citizen world, but the associations of science journalists, and I don't, there's a, the World Federation of Science Journalists based in Canada also spring to mind, but also a confederate of many, many groups around the world. And then maybe we should reach out through the Will Moy connection more to the sort of the fact checking associations and try and bring them on board as well. Um, but but yeah, I, I think the more general point as well about um, a diversity and representation, I think is really good. It's a, it's, Outside of this conversation, a big, big conversation, the whole evaluation world are having at the moment around decolonization of evaluation and why is it always the same old faces and you know why are we still talking about this issue when there are plenty of really strong evaluators based in the global south. And I think it, it echoes throughout the broader evidence system as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other insights from Julian or Lara? Nice. So I, I would just jump very quickly because every time I hear Maureen speaking, I'm so inspired. And to have a citizen champion makes such a difference. So I think when we are focusing on our third uh, key priority, we should think about in the local level, identifying those citizen champions, empowering them to uh, have their voice heard and speak uh, on behalf of the commission with their peers, because it seems to me like a great opportunity to citizens to identify themselves as people who indeed uh, are also, in a sense, evidence producers, and uh, specifically when we engage more and more uh, qualitative insights, um, citizens have a key role in that. So I, I personally am very committed to doing that in Brazil and in our region, and I would uh, strongly advise, and I think this covers a lot for diversity and representative, because in the first round of the commission, we had an indigenous leader from Brazil uh, being a commissioner, and the the sense of proudness and happiness of having this kind of representation showcase in the report is not something we should take for granted. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Mara. Um, do we have time for one more question, Jen, or do you think we need to close? I think you, you can sneak one in. I'm gonna, I'll close with just some highlights around how hopefully we can ask folks to help or how they might get engaged, but I think we can sneak one in. One in, yeah. And I'll, I'll actually um, stick with you, Lara, for, for this last question. Um, back to, um, you know, thinking about domestic evidence support systems. In, in your experience, what, what do you think success looks like? Um, because I know that's an area that we, we have the, the rest of country leads group that's looking at um, assessing, assessing their evidence support systems. We're looking at this, we're thinking about this, but what, what does success look like at the end of the day for, for a domestic evidence support system? So for me, success in a domestic evidence support system, it's all about uh, collaboration and avoiding duplication of efforts that usually result in waste. So for Brazil, my expectation is that we are able to collaborate intersectorally, that we have uh, strong evidence units embedded both uh, in governments and this culture of evidence use developed with citizens, uh, my colleagues, Danilo will be presenting in the webinar uh, on citizen engagement in February 8. Um, amazing experience they convene in the Brazilian federal government around social participation, digital social participation. So collaboration, uh, sharing priorities, not duplicating efforts, understanding that uh, evidence is a living process that should have as many voices as possible being heard. Um, this is what a strong evidence support system 
in our country for sure means and um, I, I think success has a different picture in each country in each context but we are very much fighting for this here in Brazil with the Brazilian Coalition for Evidence. That's excellent thank you so much. I'll pass it over to you Jen to uh, cl close things out for us. All right, thank you so much. First of all, thanks everyone for joining us today. Update 2024 is live. You can now mark the breakthrough events in your calendars and continue to build momentum. These are just some of the ways that you can help. Uh, share the report, socialize it with your family and friends. If you see yourselves in the work, reach out to us. There's room for you. If you're a member of the Implementation Council, we have our upcoming meeting. Uh, we have regular meetings, similarly with the rapid, uh, the rest of country leads uh, coming up the 20th of February, or it could be the 21st for advanced time zones. And then that webinar we mentioned, I mean, this is a real all hands on deck needed. And I think this, this webinar in particular is gonna be fantastic, uh, pushing past platitudes and it's very much about furthering that third priority. So, you know, come out, look for ways of working with us. We're really keen to do so. And once again, thanks to everybody for making the time to be here today, especially our panelists. We are grateful. And that adjourns today's webinar. Thanks very much, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.